Were you ever worried about your own personal security? Uh, not really. Uh, I, uh, I got a, I increased the security uh, uh, regimen around me uh, uh, when we got closer to the election because my perception was that if something happens to it, the UN will lose the whole operation. You know, after spending two billion dollars and this, you know, massive effort, that it, you know, uh, if you're foolish about your own security, then uh, and lax, then you know, you could be seen to be the cause of this faltering. So I increased the security re regime around me, and I got in some hotshot Australians, and we did that. And my wife found that she was locked in the house and this sort of thing. There was a bit of a struggle, actually. And it got quite tenuous as we got close to the election because what you were doing was holding people to the belief that you could do it. I mean, at one stage, you know, there was... Uh, uh, I, you know, I concentrated some armoured vehicles uh, in Phnom Penh for this purpose. And, uh, uh, you know, I woke up in the middle of the night and the whole... Non Pen was shaking, and I thought, well, wait a minute, we've got a coup d'etat going on. And I rang the military police guys next door and said, no, what's going on? They said, oh, it's all that armour that you said the concentrates here. <laughs> so it was our own staff. But we, uh, the post electoral environment was probably the most dangerous because uh, we were always dependent upon the uh, state of Cambodia believing that it could win the election. So all the way through, if they had ever got the idea that they were going to lose that election, then the, we would never have been able to pull it off. So it was important that they believed they were going to win it. And they were pulling lots of filthy tricks to do that anyway. But uh, um, right up to the you know closing stages of the election, uh, they started to wave and they started to get messages that they mightn't win it. Things got very shaky. And then in the post-electoral environment, there were people who were traumatised by the outcome. So there were a couple of autonomous zones formed in Cambodia and they became truly dangerous places. So we had to hold, our, we had to hold ourselves together, hold our steel in, in those places. But one of them, one of the autonomous zones was a Khmer Rouge autonomous zone which they'd set up in anticipation of a dud election where the SOC got power and all the other factions were alienated by the process. We knew that wouldn't happen, but they they had convinced themselves that it would, so they'd formed an autonomous zone up in the uh, Thai border, printed their own money and everything. And then the SOC, when they found that they'd lost, there was an autonomous zone formed on the other side of the Mekong, and uh, uh, it was sort of a threat to all the other elements that they really should play the game, and, and they almost they held the UN people on the other side of the Mekong in a uh, uh, climate of fear, I guess. Uh, and so the military guys that were there, you know, had to actually provide a very secure and staunch environment without once again getting involved in enforcement. But they were on the other side of the, of the river and uh, uh, I had to do something. I mean, we couldn't sit there powerless. I was getting phone calls from UN civilians saying, we're all going to die, you know. What are you going to do to save us? And so I, uh, I let it be known that we were going to seize the crossings on the Mekong. So I formed a contingency plan to do that. It wasn't a contingency plan, it was a real plan. Uh, concentrated the armour, we're going to run to the Mekong and secure the operations. We did it out loud so everybody knew we were going to do it. And then I had um, a message from responsible Cambodian military factions who were close to us saying, don't pour gasoline on the fire, we'll fix it up, which was my intention. And they did. 